in 2016, 36% or 57 million workers in the United States were gig workers. It's trending to 50% in 2025. What is a gig worker? You were probably wondering what that was. A gig worker is a temporary assignment. I'm a gig worker as a consultant. I come in for a couple of months from one assignment to the next. The Uber driver picks you up at point A, drives you to point B, and that five minutes is a gig. Kawhi Leonard had a seven-month gig with the Toronto Raptors and ended up winning the NBA championship. My name is Len Bertain. Uh, I teach company employees to not only recognize, but also to solve problems. Now you're probably thinking, what a boring thing to talk about. But I love it, and I want to get you to understand what I do. I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I got into this business. I started a class at 6.30 in the morning, and I was going to be teaching a class of 30 people about the Toyota production system. And over the course of the six week or the 10 weeks of the course, I was going to be delivering 160 slides. And about three slides into it, this lady raises her hand and says, and I called on her and she said she was illiterate. And you, you think about it, you know, you think of everything you're going to encounter and, you know, job. And the one thing that I didn't expect was somebody that couldn't read. So I tabled that and then I went into the next phase of my discussion and I asked the employees if they had any ideas about how they could improve the business. And all the hands went up. So I call on the first guy, and the first guy turns around and looks to the back of the room and gives me his idea. The second guy does exactly the same thing, and the third guy, and I put a hold on, hold, <laughs> something's going on here. Well, it turns out there was some manager that would sneak in the back of the room they were afraid of, and they didn't want to uh, have him do anything to them in a reciprocal or in a reprisal kind of a way. So I went up to the board and I put no blame up there, and I've since trademarked that, because that's the way you start any kind of problem-solving session, no blame. And I wanted to talk today about the gig worker who is a, sometimes a remote worker, and he can be on the bottom floor of a building when the main floor is... 20 floors up, but they're remote usually. And I was going to try to present to you in a way that we could incorporate them into the problem solving process and businesses. And so I wanted to start with the five pillars that we've used over the last 33 years of problem solving. And we started with that first class of no blame as the first pillar. Then we have empowered teams. Now, the reason you want empowered teams is workers want to participate, no blame aside. They want to participate, but they also want to accomplish something, and they will be able to accomplish something if management empowers them to actually complete their project and implement the problem uh, solution that they've developed. But one of the side benefits of that was a lady that couldn't read, she could join the team. She couldn't read, but boy, she could talk. And there was another sidebar here that we were able to take advantage of. In California, <clears throat> we, <clears throat> we have a, a lot of English as a second language people, and we're able to incorporate them into these empowered teams because the team members will support them. We also are looking for high ROA projects, and so the way I established that was saying, okay, you have to come up with $100,000 at least of problem value that, you, that the company would experience over the year if that problem consist, stayed uh, in play. 
but you can't spend more than $2,000. And the ratio of $100,000 to $2,000 was what? 50. So that's a high ROI. Well, they could spend more money, but they had to still maintain the 50 to 1 ROI. We have a six-step process, and the fun part of that is that Galileo, 350 years ago, is the one that discovered this process. You identify a problem, you come up with its root cause, and then you do the high ROI, find out how big the problem is. Your solution has to conform to the high ROI objective. You present the idea to management, and then you implement it. Now, we have a fifth pillar of our problem-solving uh, methodology, and we call it the 567 problem-solving. Uh, I can't see anybody, but if I'd asked you if anybody in here knew uh, about the 80-20 rule, would any hands go up? Uh, if you are, then that's fine. But the 567 is a subset, and if you look at this curve behind me, you'll notice that the rising of the curve is the 567 point, which is 5% of the effort to get 67% of the benefit, or 5% of the costs to get 67% of the benefit. And we've used that over and over because when you implement that, you take a small bite of the problem and you get tremendous leverage, and that's what we're focused on. My mantra is that I respect all ideas. And the reason I do that is that my clients get tremendous benefit from that and the people become truly motivated to support my effort to help them solve problems. Let's look at work. What is work? Work is what you do when you come into work on a daily basis is probably solve a problem. A typical worker might come in, see a note on a desk, the largest client, package they were expecting didn't arrive. Or a software developer, customer calls up and said, the problem software that you sold me has a bug and it's not working as you sold it to me. Whatever, any of these problems are caused by people. But the good news is people can solve them. A few more thoughts about problems. When, when I look at problems, I look at them as three part, three kinds. They're the stupid problems. Everybody knows what a stupid problem is. You've started down to try to solve this problem that you thought was a big one, and you go, how could I have been so stupid? We all do that. The other kind of a problem is a difficult problem, and that usually requires a team of some sort. It's either a team within your work directive, that's where you work, the department you work, or outside your work directive in which you have to get a team as well. But the most interesting problems are the wicked problems, and those are problems that are not only difficult, but they can have negative effects on the people. A good example is the homeless problem. You have elected officials, you have the homeless, you have the communities in which the homeless are living. And when you try to get all of them to work together to try to solve a problem, you have one problem is the elected officials want to get the 100% solution, but you never want to do that. You want to take the 567 approach, take a bite out of the problem, put something in play, and look at what happens. There's a sort of a rule of problem solving. It's called Occam's razor. Whenever you're trying to solve a problem that's pretty complicated, the simple solution is usually the best. A consequence of trying to take a bite out of the problem, implement that, is that no matter what you do in solving a problem, tomorrow, today's solution is going to be tomorrow's problem. It's a guarantee. So what you try to do is implement some, don't spend a lot of money, do the 567, and keep incrementing uh, progress on the ultimate solution. What I wanted to get around to today was how are you going to ultimately in the future deal with problem solving? We know most of people 
Every day they come in, the bulk of their day is spent problem solving. So when you look at businesses, I start with the business strategy. And I'm sure if I ask people in here, people to raise their hand, a few hands that go up. But for the others of you, a business strategy is a statement of the value proposition of the business. And that means how you're going to make money. CEO lists five, six things, and he follows all of those things. Those are ways he's going to approach the market to make money. On the other hand, what do you have? Problems. And what does the problem tell you? It tells you how bad you're implementing your strategy. So the balance between having a strategy and problems, the problems tell you what you need to do to fix your strategy. But it turns out most companies don't have a strategy to do that. So my thesis is this. We need a new paradigm to deal with the linkage of strategy to the problems that come up. And that becomes what we would call a problem-solving strategy. Because there's tremendous information in all, if you collect all of the problems you're solving over a course of a quarter and put them in some format that the CEO can look at and he can notice trends, he will change the appropriate, uh, he'll take the appropriate actions to change the course of maybe what his strategy is going down. So when you interview people in this format, you want to hire people that are good at solving problems, but also good at getting things done. So the sixth pillar might look like this. You have a group of people that can be all over the world. In this particular example, they were in Kuala Lumpur, uh, Belgium, uh, Paris, and Dallas. And we linked them together with video teleconferencing tools, any number of which is Zoom, Webinar Jam, Skype. Those are all tools that you can use to link people together. And then we just have them follow the six steps of our problem-solving process, and you have them ultimately present an idea to the CEO. But we've added another wrinkle to make this work, and that's adding a facilitator to sort of coordinate all of this activity. And he can be remote, all of them can be remote, and this can still work. So that ultimately becomes the sixth pillar of our strategy. And what that does is that allows us to integrate the great knowledge that gig workers bring to a company, even though they may be remote. You can tie them in via this technology. And so to conclude, I'm still saying we need to have uh, develop a business, a problem-solving strategy, and again, to hire people and think of them in terms of how good will they be in solving problems for our business, and secondarily, they can do get things done. You know, and what, what's interesting about all this, if somebody is good at problem-solving, you know what? They're probably good at getting things done. Thank you very much.